I, I don't know what kind of like uh, living conditions, let's call it, you guys have, because all of us are quite literally spanning the entire globe. Uh, but I live in like a 70s, you know, Soviet era building that has 50% uh, like uh, young middle aged people and then the other 50% uh, people that have literally started living in this building back when it was back when it was made. Uh, and in one of the previous episodes, I mentioned that our like, uh, not the landlord, but the main person in charge of uh, upkeep for the parts of the building that, you know, are not private property for anybody, uh, disappeared. Turns out afterwards, <laughs> he broke in his door and so on, and he wasn't. He didn't disappear. The guy just had a hardcore heart attack in his apartment. Oh, no. Yeah, and unfortunately passed, which, okay, this obviously, that obviously isn't funny. But kind of dark humor aspect of it is that all the keys for everything, all the documentation for everything uh, that is necessary in order to properly run this building was left in his <laughs> apartment. And he has absolutely no living relatives. And the cops obviously don't want to let, like, some random people, which are our neighbors, to get into the apartment. So now, because... We have no access to any of the tools that we need in order to run this apartment. Uh, it kind of started a small civil war between all the grandmas in the <laughs> building, and they keep going to each other's apartments and cussing each other out. We have like a group of Viber chat, and it's literal like uh, uh, hardcore boomer World War Seven going on. Uh, the, the elevator isn't working. Apparently, we need to fix our our roof, but uh, some people want to pay for it, some don't want to pay for it. Even it's not really a question. We have to uh, pay for it, and I just keep hearing people shouting at each other in the hallway so if at some point you uh, don't hear from me ever again it's because I was probably stabbed to death by some Soviet babushka went down. but uh, the, well, we'll see how it goes <laughs> The July days of your <laughs> yeah no man it, it, no it's literally like my building is now a, a, a small allegory I guess for uh, uh, what happens uh, without any ideological education when you remove any sort of leadership from a let's call it uh, voluntary society which is I guess the relationship between neighbors inside of a building so I'll keep you updated on uh, I don't know what I should call it uh, block number seven civil war dude when i was a when i was a uni student um my the building that i i happened to live in i basically kept to myself because i was studying all the time um or was at the uni or was at the hospital so i never you know really interacted with my neighbors um but uh, i remember one time and this is like four years into med school so i i, I had uh, i've been living there for several years um, I come down all of a sudden I see all these chairs in rows and all these all the people of the building were sitting on these chairs and there was somebody giving a presentation and apparently it's it, it was like a cooperative collective type of you know uh, building block uh, and I had no nobody told me I never got a knock on the door nobody put anything in my mail I'm like okay fuck me I guess I think that I had zero say. and my favorite part is I was going out with my bike um, from my apartment out and I walk through and I open the door to like the main uh, hall right before the main exit and I see all these chairs and they're talking and the second that I come through the door everybody stops and just starts looking at me and I'm trying to maneuver my way with, with my bike between these people's chairs oh my god yeah, that, yeah. that, that uh, was the was... moment Hakim uh, said to himself okay I'm never going to become uh, an anarchist because of the embarrassment <laughs> of that particular situation you know, exactly everybody right. participating that whole thing yeah very uh, fun no um and that same day, I fell off that that bike. I was biking somewhere to a friend's place, and I fell, and I fell so bad that the the, the bike wheel ended up twisting in on itself, um, and I got I got a bit messed up, so I couldn't even continue to the way to my friend. So I, I called him up, and he had to come with his bike to basically help carry me and what's left of my bike back to his place. Oh my god! And I to this day, I'm still I'm thinking one of those people gave me the, the evil eye, or God knows what. Yeah. They didn't like the fact that I wasn't democratically participating, uh, despite the fact that I had no idea. Anyways, have you had? Any, have you, you guys had any such experiences? <laughs> Has anybody been? <laughs> well, it sounds targeted? like they were trying to force you to be free, which is a uh, Rousseau. Yeah, exactly right. uh, that's a really amazing <laughs> <laughs> tyranny. Tyranny. Contra like contradiction. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I became a libertarian. <laughs> 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 
I, I know that in the states, especially where there like a place like places in the what the fuck do you call it the cul-de-sac or no the the come on help me out here the the places the suburban areas yeah. there's a pair like there's uh, organ specific organizations that are formed both by members but I guess owners of the particular community and then they tell you you know your grass has to be green or no more than 10 people can live in your house, which sounds absolutely insane to me for a country who's like literally number one thing is uh, property is the holiest thing of all holies. And yet they keep coming you and telling you how it should look, how it should smell, how many people get to live there. If you get to pick, put pink windows on your, on your house or not, or am I just uh, imagining some anti-American propaganda that I have internalized? That is definitely, there are these homeowner societies and these gated communities and part of the uh, conditions of ownership are that you give up control over aspects of ownership. So you're absolutely correct that this is, you know, fairly common. So this idea of my home is my castle, actually the deep dark history of some of those homeowner associations was that uh, they weren't about just trivial, superficial things. Um, they were, you know, ways of ensuring that black people, that people, for, uh, Jewish people, if you look at some of these documents from earlier part of the 20th century, when they started, you know, creating these in like the 1930s through the 1950s, is a lot of them, you know, talk about, you um, you know, no Arabs, no Jews, no blacks, you know, and it's a way of making sure that um, these new like Midwestern cities that, that were developing, that the neighborhoods would be, you know, all white and that property values would stay high. So, you know, you have to sacrifice some of your rights over property, like who you can sell to. There would be these kind of limitations. You can't sell to people who are not uh, of a certain or who fit certain categories. And the idea was that it protected everybody else's, you know, property value, mm -hmm. because if one person, you know, who was Jewish or Armenian or God forbid black, um, you know, there goes the neighborhood. So I think that's the legacy for that kind of tyranny is you have to have some kind of fascism to make sure we can all be free. You know, like that's i.e. free from like other people we don't want you know, to associate with. Brilliant. And I'm guessing they can, to an extent, keep doing it. Just, for example, you you can just say, you know, I've just built this community as like a private, uh, you know, megacorp that just built uh, 600 houses. Uh, but we do not want to sell to everyone. You have to come and interview if you want to buy a particular house in our, in our neighborhood. And then you can just literally do the same thing, just, you know, uh, uh, based on, on your perceived idea of uh, uh, the race of the people that are coming to the interview, you just exclude them to a point. But I'm guessing there's some regulation now put in in order for you uh, not to be able to do it to a full extent. So they probably fulfill like some minimum quotas and probably give uh, some of the parts of the property which uh, they consider uh, less valuable to personas non grata and so on. But, you know, that's just me me thinking of if, uh, me, me activating my, uh, like my dormant racist brain and being like, how would I do it if I, if I owned a, a suburban area? But yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting that the least to say and uh, depressing. Yeah, you uh, think, you think ci uh, Civil War Block 7 is, is bad, you know, like wait till you, you know, put the wrong uh, color curtains in your window in one of these places yeah, yeah you're you're <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll appreciate my, my grandmas a lot more now. I've got nothing to add to that. I grew up in a forest, so, <laughs> you know, people didn't know what color your windows and your blinds were because they oftentimes couldn't even see your house from the road. So I, mm. I have nothing much to add on that. And, of course, now I live in a apartment building in, in Russia, so I, nobody can see my windows up here either. <laughs> Exactly right. See, you, you, you picked the, the correct transition. You went from, I'm assuming, a very rural life in the U.S. I, I literally grew up on a ski hill. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Like, when I say right, literally, okay, I mean it was on. two blocks away from the ski jump on the top of the ski hill. Oh, damn. All right. <laughs> Well, then you moved to the right place. You basically moved to the same place, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is cold here, so, you know, like, it's only the beginning of December, and we've already had minus 40 wind chill. 
And I say minus 40 oh, because geez. it doesn't matter if I say Celsius or Fahrenheit at that point. It's true in both cases. <laughs> uh, but, you know, my plan eventually is to move back out of the city and, and into the, the rural area and somewhere of colder. Russia. But, you know, <laughs> rural Russia and when it's this cold... It'll be fun. And it will be fun also, but please do protect yourself from frostbite and make sure... Oh, to I already get, had I it know. this year. <laughs> oh, oh Jesus. My, oh, jeez. I mean, not, not bad. It was just a bit of frost nip. I know that this is yeah. audio only, so the listeners can't see, but my, my nose has been peeling for the last few days because, of course, with it being Henry, I see mm. wind chill minus 37, so I decide to go out for a three-hour walk in the forest and, you know... Eh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, not not only are you channeling Lenin with the with the beard, which, by the way, is fabulous, absolutely fantastic. Oh, I pre- the, appreciate it. The, pe- the people at home can't see, it, but it is marvelous. Not only do, are you channeling him through the beard, but you're also channeling him in the uh, in the physical activity sphere, because he too was very fond of those long walks in the <laughs> in Siberian winters. In- indeed, he My was, God. and if you look at pictures of him in the winter time, he also is criminally underdressed for the <laughs> the conditions yeah, exactly. very often. Oh my God! And so. Uh, I'm I'm one for bundling up fairly well when I go out into the forest, but the first time of the year when it gets really cold, I also intentionally go out with a little bit less than I need. That way I kind of like shock my body into it, and then the rest of the winter is smooth sailing. But this isn't any colder than what I grew up with either. Like my hometown is just this cold the same. When, when it if it if it reaches zero degrees, I I implode. <laughs> is what happens. <laughs> All right, I am definitely uh, I'm a warm warm weather guy. I I couldn't. You're a stronger man than I. Uh, keep enjoying it. Please keep. Uh, well, come not come and visit any time. I know. I'm looking at my weather right now, and the wind chill right now is a balmy minus twenty three. So it's a good oh, time wow. to come right now. Oh wow! You know, practically summer. Yeah. Practically so. I'll, I'll be sure to come on my tropical it's fit. It's the warmest it's been in a couple weeks, so... It's the only place that you want to leave your groceries out so that it's... <laughs> so that it's... <laughs> oh, no, that's true. Again, in my hometown, when it would get close to the holiday season, there's no... with. I grew up in a family of six and, you know, the extended family would often come in and stay with us and stuff like that. So we would have like 10 or 12 people in the house at a given time. And uh, there's no way you can fit that much food for, uh, and half my family's Italian. There's no way you can fit that much food in the house. So we would use the garage to store most of the food in the, in the winter time. So yeah, that's a, that's a very, you know, reminiscing experience for me. Absolutely. I have, I have 10 jars of pickles and like uh, five liters of uh, homemade rakia literally just sitting out on my balcony. And I'm sure half of the building does the same the second it hits uh, minus temperature. And I don't know if it's probably a placebo effect and our scientific Hakim is going to come in and say it is, but it's different <laughs> when it's chilled in the fridge and when it's chilled outside. It's just, I will agree. It's just different. <laughs> and, and, you know, the perfect, absolutely perfect thing when you go... Uh, 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 picnicking or something somewhere and you're bringing I don't know your sodas or your beers or whatever you prefer and you put them in uh, like you put some rocks and then uh, you put your your beers or your sodas in the chill uh, river water afterwards it just clicks better you know yeah. but it's uh, not sterile that's why yeah I guess the potential the potential of an amoeba amoeba infection <laughs> oh son of a bitch there you go you it, it keeps yeah. it spicy oh. uh, just a little bit I, I of giardia agree. amongst friends is yeah. what really adds adds to it <laughs> Exactly. Hello and welcome back everybody to the program. Today we have a fantastic episode with two fantastic guests that have combined Three. into uh, a, a Three guests. I mean a, 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 no no t- two guests as in two podcast ah, two guests oh, okay, okay. sorry my bad. 3 total people but two units that have joined uh, to to make quite the cocktail um, I'm sure you've heard of uh, these two fantastic uh, groupings we have Rev Left Radio which has been on before and our fantastic Brett who has made beyond a contribution uh, to the English speaking left it is genuinely he his work is generally one of the, the best out there uh, and uh, guerrilla history pod which likewise has become a force of its own i i could say most likely the two most influential socialist shows within the english language um and that is not uh, that's not something to take lightly their work is fantastic it's academic it's beautifully presented it covers everything between anti-imperialist and class conscious theory to struggles of people around the globe particularly against the uh, ever heavy though paper-filled imperial boot um it is a pleasure to have you guys uh, on board uh, and on with us today please let the people know 
who you are, what you do, where they can find you um, before we get started. Sure, yeah, I'll start. Um, one, I'm glad you pointed out um, Henry's facial hair looking a lot like Lennon. He's in his Lennon era. It looks it looks great. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking that the last three episodes, I just didn't get a chance to tell him that. So that's funny. Um, but yeah, my, my name is Brett. I am the host of Rev Left Radio, the co-host of Red Menace, and uh, the co-host of, of Gorilla History. So happy to be <laughs> love, love the D program. Love being back with, with you two. So yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, the listeners couldn't see, but uh, I just <laughs> held up a Lennon bust in front of my face. And uh, I do that to my wife sometimes when we're on the call, and she absolutely <laughs> hates that, which just encourages me to do it even more the next time. Uh, so yeah, Green that's... Green energy. I love it. Yeah, that's my <laughs> that's my little hobby while we're uh, apart. But in any case, I'm Henry Huckamaki. I'm one of the co-hosts of Guerrilla History alongside Adnan and Brett. Uh, I'm an educator, a uh, longtime activist. And the only other really interesting thing about me, I guess, other than the fact that I'm an American that lives in Russia, which is quite interesting... Uh, is that I am one of the co-translators and editors of the new authorized English edition of Domenico Lacerdo's Stalin History and Critique of a Black Legend, which came out from Iskra Books. Fantastic. My God. So people are... <laughs> For the listeners, this means that we have actually educated and qualified people on, unlike us. <laughs> uh, I love it. That's absolutely fantastic. Adnan, uh, do you have anything to add? Oh, sure. I'm Adnan Hussain. I'm... Uh... A uh, also a co-host of Guerrilla History, and I'm a, a historian of the medieval Mediterranean and Islamic world. Uh, so all this modern history is really just a fun sidelight, um, but I focus mostly on Muslim, Christian, Jewish interactions in the medieval world. Um, so I think we'll get into it, I'm sure, but I think colonialism and imperialism basically have a, has a really long history. So I might <laughs> uh, pull some of your listeners back into uh, the dark ages. Please do. We absolutely love it. Fascinating. Fantastic. Thank you, boys, for uh, the absolutely lovely introduction that you uh, gave us. Uh, of course, all their links uh, will be provided uh, below. Um, so go check out their work. They're going to have an, uh, we're going to go through it again at the end of the podcast, but uh, you should be already familiar with, with everybody who's present here uh, by now. If you're not, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> um, but anyway, bad boy, uh, bad boy. In... <laughs> uh, this show <clears throat> that we were on, we talk a lot about capitalism. Um, Sometimes we, we think that uh, we take a bit of a centrist position. Sometimes we think that might not be the best thing in the world. <laughs> Maybe it, it may outlive it, it may have outlived its usefulness, uh, quite possibly. But yeah, um, <laughs> moving aside from the silliness, though, one of the things that we like to cover as well, um, not as deeply as you guys, uh, though, is the topic of imperialism itself. Let's begin our conversation there. What is the quote unquote objective definition of imperialism, if there even is such a thing? Why? How is it connected to capitalism? Why did capitalism give rise to this particular interesting development of human uh, socioeconomic and cultural interaction that historically never existed? Give us th the deep dive, uh, please. Sure. Yeah, I, I can start. Um, you know, there's, there's probably a, a colloquial definition of imperialism that is sort of diluted and watered down that that is that sort of takes precedence outside the marxist and leninist context sometimes imperialism is just meant like one country going into another country a bigger country taking over a smaller country or whatever um, but the importance of the marxist analysis is that it, it it understands imperialism as a product of a uh, synonymous with a certain stage of capitalism right so um, Lenin famously called imperialism the highest stage of capitalism. And throughout that entire text, he's really linking what we call modern imperialism to the development of monopoly capitalism. So I'm not going to be one of these guys that reads too much from text, but I'm going to read this one definition um, from Lenin's imperialism because I think it um, sort of clarifies what imperialism is in the context of this conversation. And interestingly, Lenin himself ties it to colonialism, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, so Lenin says, quote, if it were necessary to give the briefest possible definition of imperialism, we should have to say that imperialism is the monopoly stage of capitalism. Such a definition would include what is most important for, on the one hand, finance capital is the bank capital of a very few big monopolist banks merge with the capital of the monopolist associations of industrialists. And on the other hand, the division of the world is the transition from a colonial policy, which has extended without hindrance to territories unseized by any capitalist power, 
So, you know, regular colonialism, going into new territories and seizing them, back to Lenin, to a colonial policy of monopolist possession of the territory of the world, which has been completely divided up. So in, in both instances of of his definition of imperialism, he's saying it's a it's the monopoly stage of capitalism, and he's tying it to colonial policy. And we might get into some of those differences um, in a bit. But standing back from that, I would just say as my final uh, thoughts on on this uh, on this subject is that imperialism, capitalism, colonialism, these are different faces of a sort of unified process or phenomena. So when we talk about imperialism, we're talking about capitalism. We're 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 referencing and alluding to colonialism, et cetera. And that will hopefully become more clear throughout the rest of the conversation. I'll jump in uh, now to kind of add into this. So Brett does open with Lenin. And of course, Lenin, he wasn't the first person to theorize imperialism. But I think that we can say that from the Marxist perspective, he was the first great theorist of imperialism. Although I, I would say that in many ways, his analysis was so good for the time that it actually impeded further developments in the analysis of imperialism, which is something that we can talk about. It probably doesn't even fit in this conversation. So we'll just put that aside. But the point is, is that Lenin's, Lenin's definition of imperialism was quite good for the time. It's still very applicable today, although it does need a little bit of tweaking to think about the modern context of society and political economy. But to add in, just to kind of concretize what Lenin was saying were the five main features of imperialism or monopoly capitalism, I'm actually going to paraphrase him by using somebody who we've interviewed on guerrilla history before, uh, Joma Sison, who paraphrases Lenin very well. I know imperialism isn't a long text in, in general, but uh, Joma Sison takes the main points in one of his works, Basic Principles of Marxism-Leninism, and condenses it better than I can. So, uh, and just so the listeners know, Joma Sison was the founding chairman of the Communist Party of the Philippines. And like I said, we have an interview on guerrilla history with him. So just to clip some bits of what he used to summarize Lenin's position is that Monopoly means that one company or a, a single combination of companies controlled by a single group of capitalists dominate the main part or entirety of an industry. I think that most people are familiar with that definition of monopoly. Then the merger of industrial capital and bank capital has put more capital at the disposal of the monopoly capitalists than ever before and has spawned a finance oligarchy that amasses profits not because of its entrepreneurial skills, but because it simply controls and manipulates finance capital. The monopoly capitalist class hires the managers to run its productive enterprises and as a rentier class simply sits back and awaits the dividends from shareholdings. Then moving on to the next point, and again, I'm skipping large portions of this, uh, but listeners, you can get the PDF for free from Foreign Languages Press. The export of surplus capital takes the form of loans and direct investments. This is something that we've seen a lot of, by the way, just as an aside. These serve to relieve the capitalist economy not only of its capital glut, but also of its surplus commodities. We've talked about that on guerrilla history before, so I'm not going to belabor that point. Uh, moving on, according to the law of uneven development, capitalist countries differ in economic strength, and they therefore take their place in the capitalist world accordingly. But according to the same law, growth and competition of the capitalist economies continues to upset every given balance of relations. And then lastly, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was no more part of the world that was not under the domination of a capitalist power or a number of capitalist powers. Africa had been the last continent to be fully divided among the capitalist countries. The division of the world among the capitalist powers was completed. A redivision of the world was no longer possible without causing a war. And in this regard, Lenin said that imperialism means war. So just to get that out of the way, so when we talk about Lenin's definition of imperialism, these are kind of the five main points of it. But to talk a little bit more about the relationship between capitalism and imperialism, we have to understand that capitalism as a system seeks to maximize profits and that imperialism is necessary at a certain stage to provide avenues through which this objective is achieved. Imperialist adventurism helps capitalist nations access natu natural resources in various parts of the world when they wouldn't have access to these resources in their own countries, enabling accumulation of wealth through resource extraction. 
And of course, we can get into the, the conversation of unequal exchange at a certain point. Of course, we know about market expansion within certain capitalist countries. The market is actually relatively small, but as you expand, uh, you provide more of a market for you to sell your produced products in. It also provides avenues for labor exploitation because, of course, in imperialist countries, uh, the availability of cheap labor is often not large enough to sustain the the production of the goods the commodities that are produced by the imperialist countries or by companies that are owned by capitalists in the imperialist countries and therefore they have to expand their reach in order to exploit cheap labor in other parts of the world that are not as developed and imperialism allows the capitalist powers to uh, extend their control beyond their national borders and to extend monopolistic control over key industries and resources multinationally. Uh, and as you think about how these processes work, you think about how capitalism has to continue to develop itself, but at certain stages of its development, it kind of runs up against hard limits of what it's able to do within a specific national context or within a specific resource context and therefore expansion into other territories is necessary in order to enable the expansion of capitalism which of course is in the interest of the capitalists that are ruling those imperialist countries. Wow, that's some great stuff uh, from both of you about what I would say is the co-evolution historically of imperialism and capitalism and i think what henry was talking about just there about uh, the way in which imperialism is necessary to enable the development of capitalism to overcome you know various political boundaries i mean that's the point is that capitalism as an economic system doesn't want to have to be limited by you know, political uh, constraints. And so we see imperialism is one necessary mechanism, you could say, for the extension of capital's reach. And if you think about it uh, historically, I think you can see that they're very intimately connected. And it's important to see that historically, because I think Marx, when people read Capital, He's talking about a kind of ideal system almost in the abstract of how capital functions by critiquing these political economic theorists on their own terms to you know, really expose how capitalism actually works and what its consequences are. But what it means is that he doesn't cover some of the historical aspects of its initial development. Um, you know, completely uh, thoroughly. He's looking mostly at like the England case, right? Um, and I think, you know, one big issue that he puts off until late chapters uh, that he doesn't explore as much, um, but is so important is this idea of primitive accumulation. That is actually absolutely the foundation for where does capital actually come from initially before it develops industrial production, before it does various kinds of things um, that enable the social relations around how you organize labor uh, in weight in terms of wage labor. Well, all that has to come from somewhere. What's the beginning point? And I think really you have to look at conquest, war, militarism, colonialism. Uh, as the key factors that enable the so-called European takeoff. I mean, that's how it's built. You know, when you look at it, I think that there's, you know, other components of it that I think that are important is when I think of imperialism, I think of that fundamentally as a very kind of modern ideological and set of practices that enable capitalism's extension. However, uh, empires go back really far. So sometimes people are confused. Well, well, there were always empires. So how can we talk about the specific kind of analysis of imperialism? I think an important point to note here, indeed, empires have a long history. There's a real difference between empires and imperialism and the way these modern forms function. All of the empires you can think of in the, the past, from Roman times to the Achaemenid Persian Empire, Sassanian Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and of course, the Abbasid Empire, the Ottoman Empire, or the Mongol World Empire. These were land-based empires based on conquest. They're contiguous. But also what's important and interesting is that they were dynastic. They were not of a nation state 
or a people that dominated some other mm-hmm. people as a whole, as a totality. And what mm-hmm. made an empire is that it's composed of many different peoples who are subordinate as subjects, not as citizens, right? That's a very modern kind of concept, but as subjects to some ruling family that may have a particular ethnicity or identity or religion, but that's very different from what happens in the modern, what we call empires, but colonial empires. Modern colonialism is nation states that create uh, citizens or subjects, but nation states that totally dominate another nation, another country, other lands, and other peoples as subordinates to the entire nation and nation state. And that's very different from, you know, like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire of the Tsars. Uh, And so we need to distinguish historically, when does imperialism come about? And I think you can see that it's very connected with the rise of capitalism as uh, you know, historically, as, as it emerges, and that the two really go hand in hand. There's a lot more we could talk about it, but I think the one other thing that I would want to say about it is that something happens in Europe that's unique and different. And of course, that's what so much of history has been. It's like, why does Europe become this, you know, global hege- you know, uh, you know, ex- exerts global hegemony over the world? Is it because of the rise of capitalism? Is it because of, you know, colonial? Is it because of technological changes that allow it to colonize and that then, you There's know, there's just something the, in the water. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, it's some, well, yeah, this is the thing is some people like Jared Diamond, you know, wants to come up with this like ecological, well, it's some unique set of ecological factors. I, what I would say is that it's, the war making, the level of violence that it's prepared to unleash upon the world through its its colonizing ventures. And, you know, this kind of campaign that it has of like ethnic cleansing, forced conversion, inquisition, expulsion, and suppression of heresy and dissent. I take this back to the medieval period. I think it's the Crusades, you know, and the new settler colonies that it establishes in the crusader states, the rise of these Italian merchant, you know, kind of commerce and a system of enslavement, domination and attempts to create plantation style agricultural production in the Mediterranean, in Sicily, in Cyprus, in the Latin kingdoms, in the reconquered, they say reconquered, but it's just new settler colonialism, conquered areas of the Iberian Peninsula they develop a whole system of of religious and racialized hierarchy of enslavement that goes hand in hand with some of these other technical and technological developments that are then exported into the Atlantic world. And, you know, the uh, kind of slave system of West African uh, slaves, well, they already had slave systems. It's just on a smaller scale. What happens is it, it gets globalized by going out into the Atlantic system. And it's that kind of primitive accumulation through colonial and imperial exploitation, war and violence, and a whole system of racial exclusion that is what creates Europe's comparative advantage in the era of capitalism. And we could talk a little bit more. I'm sure those are a lot. That's a lot. But those were kind of two points if you look at it from a long history rather than just the modern perspective that I think help us understand why Lenin crystallized those key five factors uh, in uh, his study of imperialism. Beautifully, beautifully put. That was a, a fantastic masterclass, honestly, from all three of you. This, uh, these ideas can be developed almost endlessly because uh, imperialism as a world system is so interconnected and has gone through, th- through so many stages of development, uh, including primordial uh, stages in pre-capitalist formations, as uh, Adnan mentioned, which almost give it like a ethereal historical characteristic, not to make it too metaphysical, right? But the trend, it's much like capitalism, right? There are bits and pieces of what could be considered preliminary capitalist development, forms of primitive accumulation, for example, that existed in pockets in the Northern Italian republics, in some of the uh, North African and West Asian empires. Um, Of course, uh, Ibn Khaldun is known for his uh, groundbreaking uh, historical work and analysis uh, of this fact. Um, But it never took on the form that, or like the grotesqueness, let's say, that uh, Adnan mentioned, um, until it was transported along with 
slave trade to the New World, uh, past the Atlantic. And this is something that makes it the most interesting system to analyze as part of capitalism because imperialism only took this form because of capitalism. It was almost as a, it was a stillborn child until the productive forces that could be mobilized along with capitalist production, centralization of capital, amongst others, the formation of uh, long commodity chains across several continents even, which didn't really exist on the way that we know it now. Only once capitalism allowed itself to, uh, or established itself and threw its roots down, could the system, this barbarity really emerge. Why do you guys think this is the case? Why was it capitalism per se? Um, maybe I kind of jumped the gun by answering it, of course, the uh, centralization of the capital and the <laughs> massive commodity, chain, of course. But I would love to hear your perspective as well. Why is it necessary that capitalism uh, is the system that really, you know, shocked imperialism into life and, of course, then developed ca- capitalism even further? That's a great question, a really, you know, big question. Like we're taking on these really big, heavy questions. Um, I mean, we have you here, so we got to milk yeah, well, you, right. as, <laughs> milk you yeah, as hard as we can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, one, one component I think that, that's very important is that um, you could not get um, the kind of uh, full born, you know, uh, developed capitalism in Europe that comes to dominate the world uh, without, I think, using violence, like it just wasn't mm. possible. Like this, um, take one example. Okay, a um, uh, very good book uh, by Sven Beckert, uh, Empire of Cotton. You know, we think of, you know, Marx, what does he base his studies on? Like the principal example is looking at the textile mills, right? You know, in the Midlands in England, Industrial Revolution, the loom, the you know the the steam loom, the automated loom, and the factories that develop, and how this kind of you know, in Manchester and Birmingham and so on, and that is the basis for the industrial revolution. First thing to say is that textiles, before the era of petroleum and petroleum products of plastics, is like the high tech you know industry. It's the most labor intensive, and it's like so useful, like everything from. It's not just like clothing that you wear, but like wall decorations, carpets, uh, it, bags, right? You know, things to contain things and transport things. Uh, so textiles uh, were like a key industry, you could say. And um, you had long thousand year histories of artisanal craft development mm-hmm. of techniques, you know, to really efficiently and effectively make good, good quality linen and cotton textiles in India, in Egypt. Um, and the British were not able to, you know, really outcompete the cottager Indian weaver, mm. despite all the supposed technological development. They couldn't actually outcompete them. They destroyed Indian weaving. They it destroyed, actively destroyed it. And that was necessary, really, they had two factors. They had to destroy their competitors and they had to use enslaved labor to produce the cotton at a you know, lower rate in the Americas, uh, in the U.S. South. So, you know, capitalism isn't just this kind of, you know, genius form of like social mm-hmm. relations. It depends really on this kind of violent subordination and destruction of these other ways of producing in order to kind of eliminate the social relations. If you think about it, well, the Indian cottager is embedded in a whole set of local social relations, you know, in a kind of village society. They have to, you know, this kind of form of factory organization, like the Mm. whole point of it is it's both violence abroad and it's violence within. You have to dispossess people of their land, make them completely dependent. This is all of Marx's analysis. The other side of it, however, is just you also have to dispossess and destroy people, people's ways of life in other parts of the world in order for this to actually work successfully. So I think that's an example of the way they're intimately connected with one another. Just very briefly to add in, and it's going to be very brief because I think Adnan hit everything super, super well. But one thing that I do want to add is that imperialism, as we understand it, requires a certain degree of sophistication Hmm. and it requires a certain degree of coordination. And this is something that we really see arising 
in the era of capitalism, with this consolidation of capital, the centralization of capital, and the development of these structures outside of like these monarchies, we actually have the development of capitalist industry within places that then allows for the coordination and complexity required for these processes that we underlined in terms of what is imperialism to be carried out. It's one thing to have some monarch say, you know, let's go out and uh, carry out violence against our neighbor or some other some other place that has resource X that we would like. It's another thing to have the sophistication, the uh, structures in place within your country to be able to effectively do that and to benefit from doing so in a way that then consolidates your position in the world stage. So that's not to say that I disagree with anything that Adnan said. I completely yeah. agree with everything Adnan said. I just want to underscore that in terms of we, we've we had violence throughout history. But what is it about this stage of capitalism that really allowed for the expansion of imperialism? It is in part, in addition to what Adnan said, the fact that capitalism did allow for an increasing amount of complexity and organization exactly. within society as well, which was required for the development of imperialism. Uh, one thing that I think some people, the less sophisticated critics of, of Marxists or Marxism, happen to, or they seem to be under the misconception that Marxists have a overwhelming, or not overwhelming, uh, a spanning, basically, extensive uh, and all uh, expansive disdain for capitalism just because of the consequences of the system currently. We fundamentally understand that capitalism was and is a better step uh, in development over feudalism and other pre-capitalist formations. It allowed for the ability to create massive urban centers with uh, highly developed interconnected industrial zones, which could allow the productive forces to develop to a point which eventually could lay the grounds to raise the collective well-being of society. The difference is that because of the logic of capital, instead of it raising the um, uh, this is more or less a uh, undesired byproduct of capitalist development, raising the quality of life of the lowest people. And by the way, it was a very short-lived thing that crumbled uh, very quickly afterwards. The common graph that people are aware of where they're like, they see 1850 and then, oh, the living standards are improving after. Yeah, well, that just shows what, what they leave out of that is the past 350, 400 years of the primordial capitalism that eventually developed from the Venetian city-states to the UK, which caused a drastic and massive deterioration of living standards across the globe. Uh, in some places, they still have not recovered even to this day. But moving all that aside, we understand the that capitalism at one point did serve a useful function, but it has outlived its usefulness. That's the core of it. Allow me to step in for one second here, very Go quickly. Ahead, yeah. So this is something that we often hear, and I think that most Marxists would agree with the the idea that capitalism was an advancement on previous society. And in many cases, people will phrase it as capitalism was a progressive development on previous society. In Again, I think, forces, in sense, yeah. I, I think most I think most Marxists would agree with you. But when you mention progress, uh, productive forces there, that is the key point, yeah. because oftentimes when when those of us that are thinking deeply about these issues will say something like capitalism was a progressive development upon previous systems, people who listen to that will tend to think of that in a more universalizing way. Yeah. And so we have people like Ali Kadri, who's becoming a, a good friend of mine. I, I really yeah, appreciate him. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, he's, we text back and forth all the time. But he I'm jealous. <laughs> very frequently, oh, I, I'm sure that he would love to talk with you. But in any case, he uh, very frequently will say, Capitalism, it is false to call capitalism a progressive system. I do not believe in any way that Ali is saying that capitalism is not a, pro a progressive development of productive forces within society. Mm. But using the term progressive in any way then can allow capitalists to say, well, look, it was an improvement on previous society, but in some ways... And in many ways, and, and we talk about this with the in increasing complexity, the increasing ability to carry out violence abroad. Yes, it did allow for the raising of living standards over what was happening previously in those capitalist countries, but it also allowed for the increasing terror abroad of the capitalist countries. And therefore, it is important that when we talk about, if we're thinking of things in an even remotely stagist way, which I don't want to get mm. into the conversation <laughs> yeah. of stages, <laughs> etc., because I mean, that's a whole other yeah. conversation. But the point is, is that if we are thinking of it even slightly like, you know, there are stages that things can go through, not that they must go through, but that they can go through. 
we have to grapple with the fact that capitalism, while having some of these benefits that we that you've enumerated, also has allowed for the increased repression and increased violence on populations, not only within the country, but especially abroad outside of these of developing capitalist countries. And so it's very, very important that we be careful when talking about the role of capitalism. So yeah, yeah. again, I don't think that you disagree with it. I just want to make sure that I mm. push back a little bit on that, for on that sure, term. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Thank you for the very needed uh, clarification. Sometimes when we're in, uh, when we're sitting amongst uh, other Marxists, who we we all kind of know what we're talking about between each other. So the need for caveats kind of goes out the window. But sometimes we forget that there are people listening who may not have this necessary prerequisite uh, perspective. So th- I very thank you, Henry. I very much ex- appreciate it. Uh, there's one more thing before I get into the next question. One more thing I want to build up on uh, that Adnan said, which was. By the way, um, what a dense answer that we've been dissecting for like 20 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, what I was going to say is you mentioned the point of um, with, with the British um, colonial attitudes or attempts at destroying, and then of course the successful attempts at destroying Indian industry, which was mostly artisanal, even though it was still complex to a degree, but mostly artisanal. They destroyed it with the hopes that number one, um, they can uh, essentially root out and get rid of uh, completely competitive, um, like uh, essentially productive centers um, so that they can monopolize a particular sector for themselves, as well as um, cause the immiseration of the labor pool in a particular area to keep raw inputs and labor cheap. Uh, And what's interesting is that the incredibly um, transparent and clear way that this was done back then is paralleled very nicely to to today is just obfuscated through um, structural uh, readjustment programs driven by the I, uh, IMF or the World Bank is uh, put in the phraseology of human rights and 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 uh, sa- economic sanctions in order to um, dress up you know the the drive for liberal democratic values that need to be pushed on X or Y in country when the basis is almost always exclusively economic. Um, this is just something to highlight that this is a a thing that is a thread that is extended. And to this very day, um, is just they've gotten slightly more sophisticated with the presentation, but not much, <laughs> not by much, as we're seeing in a in several parts of the world ongoing, uh, from West Asia to uh, Eastern Europe. Um, moving on, I would love to get a, a question. This is going to be a long episode, guys. <laughs> um, if if you would indulge me, please. The trend of imperialism, of course, started with a very blatant colonialism, right? It was very in your face boots on the ground with guns trying to uh, take direct political control over um, economic resources and the labor behind them uh, to mobilize it towards the ends of the colonizing force and that particular nation, the economic productivity of said nation. Um, This was the first step, colonialism. And then it transitioned into this more nebulous imperialism, more conglomerate focused, more hands off, but even more entrenched, if you understand what I'm saying. Why is it that colonialism was the first step? Why didn't it just immediately jump to this imperialist, you know, hands-off approach, let's say? Well, first and foremost, we have this sort of, this outlay that, that you know, our analysis of capitalism talks about colonialism as this necessary phase in the development of capitalism. You know, we talk about primitive accumulation. So there's this this process that takes place sort of before the rise of industrial capitalism that is necessary for that rise. And then we talk about imperialism as the territorial domination of monopoly capital, which is a later development of capitalism. So earlier, my earlier answer, I, I, I was urging people to sort of see these as different faces of a, of a sort of singular process or or phenomena. And I think that um, sort of makes sense. You know, colonialism is this primitive accumulation stage. Then you have the rise of industrial capitalism, the rise of finance monopoly capitalism, and ergo um, imperialism, which is synonymous with monopoly capitalism. Um, but there's also some subtleties within within colonialism, right? There's like the classic example of colonialism. I, I often think of that we were just talking about the British Empire in India. Then there's settler colonialism, where you're actively trying to take over the land and settle it with a foreign population. We see the Brits do that in North America, Australia, Europeans do it in South Africa, obviously Palestine, which we'll get to eventually the French in Algeria. So that's a very so there's a different type of of colonialism there. And then I think in the modern era, we're much more used to seeing uh, what we call neocolonialism which is this more abstracted version of colonialism where it's not shoving a gun in somebody's face or it's not killing the quote-unquote savages so you can take their land. 
but it's a more it's it's a reflection of the of the increasing sophistication and subtlety of these uh, mechanisms of domination where you have like the installation of comprador regimes right exploiting a country's resources and economic output through um, these these mechanisms like the IMF through these globalized systems um, that are that are much more subtle and 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 are allowed to be justified in terms of um, more subtle propaganda, um, etc. But the the lines do kind of get blurry, um, right? French neo-colonialism in Africa today takes the form of imperialism. So what is it neo-colonialist or is it imperialist? Well, it's both at the same time. And, uh, and and in this way, you can kind of see imperialism and colonialism not only sharing similar roots and being products of, of a similar uh, uh, underlying economic system, but as sort of merging into one another in the, in the modern era in interesting ways. The U.S. is a settler colonial entity with oppressed nations within its borders who is the leading modern imperialist power in the world today. Um, so these these processes... While they are definitionally different and we should understand them conceptually as sort of these distinct periods in time, they're also part of this broader singular process and phenomena that I think is important to, to emphasize as well. I'll hop in here and just mention that, as Brett said, that we when we think of colonialism, we're often thinking of examples of kind of just the, the bog standard form of uh, colonialism. To, in terms of what's going on now, we, we aren't typically thinking of settler colonialism. And in many cases, that is because, not because settler colonialism is not ongoing, but because it is ignored by most bourgeois academics. It is ignored by the media. It is ignored by most people that don't want to grapple with the fact that they're on stolen land in most cases. You know, the United States is an ongoing settler colonial project and to pretend otherwise is kind of foolish. Um, you know, Palestine, as we mentioned, Unless you're looking at the Marxist left, we're often not talking about how that is a, a textbook case of settler colonialism. So settler colonialism is an ongoing process, and it is important to keep that in mind. And as Brett mentioned, neocolonialism is really an important uh, analytical way of looking at how colonialism primarily manifests itself today. Uh, and I, I think that I'm, I'll hold talking about neocolonialism for a little bit now because that's really a, a rather dense topic in itself. And I'll just throw out a couple of book recommendations first. And then uh, again, maybe we'll loop back to the neocolonialism after I say my next bit, which is that if you're, if you're interested in neocolonialism, of course, you can read the book Neocolonialism, The Highest Stage of Imperialism by Nkrumah. But as Brett mentioned, with the example of France acting as a neocolonial power primarily in West Africa today, there's an absolutely terrific book that came out just a couple of years ago. And it's very short. It's about 140 pages long. And I think that on guerrilla history, we should uh, interview the authors sometime soon. It's called Africa's Last Colonial Currency, the CFA Franc Story. Uh, like I said, it just came out. Let me look. I have it in my hands. So it came out 2020 in English. It originally came out in French in 2018. So it's only a couple of years old. And it's really an outstanding book by Fanny Peugeot and Ndongo Samba Sula. So recommendation right there. But if we're looking at colonialism versus imperialism, I just want to, and this will be, I'll try to keep it brief. I want to put these two things side by side on a couple of points just to look at them and how they relate to each other. So the first point would be economic and political domination. So imperialism and colonialism are both rooted in that same pursuit of economic and political dominance by more powerful nations against less powerful nations. Under capitalism, that pursuit of domination is driven by the need, as I mentioned earlier, for new markets, resources, labor, etc. Imperialism and colonialism both enable the dominant powers to exert their control over weaker nations and exploit resources and reap economic benefits for themselves. The second point is territorial control. Colonialism mostly, again, we're talking about different forms. We talked about settler colonialism, neocolonialism, and we'll probably circle back to those two different forms eventually. But colonialism mostly focuses on the physical occupation and administration of territories by foreign powers, whereby the colonizing nation establishes in some way direct rule or control over the colonized area, uh, and then uses that control to exploit the resources and labor for the benefit of the regime and the colonial power, as well as to some extent, the 
I, you know, people are going to be very mad at me. The working class and the colonial power, uh, they'll be mad at me if they don't believe in the aristocracy of labor in any case. Whereby imperialism is a much broader idea in terms of how it manifests itself. It goes far beyond just thinking about territorial control in this very simple way. They don't have to necessarily physically colonize a territory. I know that, again, neocolonialism is a different case. But instead, they, they exercise their economic and political hegemony over it through things like indirect rule, economic coercion, supporting puppet regimes, which again feeds into neocolonialism. So they don't need to have that direct administration. Ideological justification is another thing that I would like to put side by side for just a moment. Again, this is like very surface level analysis. We could get much deeper on any of these. But colonialism very, very often, almost always relied on explicitly racist or ethnocentric ideologies that justified and legitimize the colonization process. And as Brett said, you know, quote unquote, savages earlier, that is the kind of phraseology that you often hear when we are talking about colonialism. Not that we don't also hear it in imperialism and not that that notion is not in the back of the minds with imperialism, but that is often a driving narrative uh, in the ideological justification of colonialism. There's often this idea of a civilizing mission, which I know Adnan could speak to far more uh, at length and eloquently than I could. And this is often used to show the colonizers as morally superior, that they can bring economic development and cultural superiority to these supposedly backward societies. Whereas imperialism usually uses, let's say, more subtle ideological justifications in many cases. Again, this is not like a one-size-fits-all analysis, just mm. surface level here. Uh, so they'll often claim that they're spreading democracy. Where have we heard that before? Mm. Fostering economic progress, promoting international stability or the rules-based order. I mean, <laughs> these are the sorts of things that we hear today. But behind these ideological facades... The underlying motive is exactly the same. The pursuit of that economic and political interest for the benefit of the capitalist ruling class in the capitalist imperialist countries. And then lastly, just very briefly, let's talk about the impact of the colonized very briefly, which is that under both imperialism and colonialism, the impact is absolutely devastating on the colonized peoples. The exploitation of resources, forced labor, Cultural suppression under colonial rule often, almost almost always, leads to tremendous suffering and deprivation of the peoples that live in those areas. Whereas under imperialism, the economic hegemony and political interference of the dominant powers, they create a cycle of underdevelopment and dependency. And the profits extracted from the colonized territories perpetuate inequalities, poverty, and social unrest that lead to, if not as explicit or graphic a form of suffering and deprivation as colonialism oftentimes did, we still see those same sorts of structures perpetuate due to both imperialism and colonialism with these incredibly devastating consequences of the people in the colonized or dominated countries under imperialism. Yeah, that was ju just one quick thing. Just uh, I think you were very, uh, a very good question that you raised there, Akeem, about you know, well, where does colonialism fit? Um, when you look at the regimes of control in today's world, um, you know, you don't ha always, I mean, you know, uh, the United States has sent armies around the world and it has a network of, you know, 800 or so military, you know, bases that are disclosed uh, around the world as part of its, you know, uh, hegemony over the, over the world militarily. Uh, but it doesn't always have to control, you know, nations, economies and things through uh, that kind of militaristic means or actual conquest and direct rule and control in the earlier uh, era of colonialism. But then that period, they did not have the technical means, you know, and practices so organized for being able to exert that control. You actually had to, you know, kind of send a navy and kind of work through those kind of direct sorts of means. And, um, with all the developments that have taken place, now it's possible. And of course, it's necessary after the era of decolonization, where colonized peoples waged, you know, struggles, mm -hmm. bloody struggles to free themselves from direct colonial rule. 
it wasn't going to be possible or easy to simply reimpose that. And so they've developed more uh, sophisticated techniques with the IMF, the World Bank, the you know global free trade agreements, and their whole regimes that of investment uh, funds and so on that constrain the possibilities and horizons of even a you know basically basically take sovereignty in a real material sense away. And that's of course what. Henry and Brett were both talking about as neo-colonialism and, and its its practice. Um, but I did want to say, you know, that it's a little bit like, um, you know, I was I studied Arabic in in Syria in like the 1990s because I'm a lot mm-hmm. older than I think than the rest of you folks. I'm uh, the old fogey here, so I actually <laughs> doesn't remember, look it. Yeah, <laughs> too bad this is an audio, you know, <laughs> format, you know, but. Um, mm-hmm. So I studied in the 90s. So this is before the terrible events that just have destroyed Syria. This, you know. mm. And, uh, you know, people told me, oh, you're going to study in Syria. It's such an authoritarian, you know, country. You must be afraid to, you know, the political repression. And yeah, of course, it was an author, you know, it was a dictatorship. And there had been, there is political repression, there was and is political repression in various ways. But one thing people complain is like, well, the Muhabarat, the secret police, they're always going to be trailing you and all, all that. And yes, I saw somebody like when I left my apartment, occasionally I noticed, oh, there's the same person who seems to be like taking an interest in my affairs. But I told people, well, yeah, they actually have to send a guy yeah. to go do it, right? <laughs> In the United States, they don't have to send a guy. So you think you're free, but they've got mechanisms Mm. and techniques of surveillance. There's social mechanisms for control. If you get too far out of line, suddenly you're not getting job offers. Your career is affected. And we know this from social media that the level of technology for surveillance has just ramped up so much higher. Now we provide freely all this information about ourselves. And so basically you move from crude techniques that involve direct kind of like in your face. uh, Invasions of privacy. That's right. Yeah. And then it goes to like, you know, more, you know, technical means that are less visible to you, but are mm. far more pervasive and far more, you know, controlling. Uh, mm. So I think that's kind of what we've seen in this transition is that there are different stages and techniques, um, you know, in, in these forms of social control, um, both at an individual level, if we talk about in our own societies, but also globally, when we speak of what controls the fates of nations, it's no longer, you know, these countries no longer have sovereignty to make certain kinds of decisions about their economy, their currency, what kinds of social supports and programs they're going to have because they have to follow these regimes through uh, international organizations and through the organization of the international global economy that prevent them from meeting people's needs and having to make priorities of other people's, you know, uh, interests. Beautifully put. I I would say just one little point to add on to what you said, Adnan, uh, about the surveillance point. Uh, the same people who will decry that uh, even like low squ- low scale crude um, uh, attempts at monitoring uh, in Syria, for example, uh, these people who decry authoritarian regimes, quote unquote authoritarianism, whatever that's supposed to mean, that's a much bigger discussion on its own. These people who live in again practically bugged houses, um, who carry phones with microphones and and cameras on them at all times, uh, which repeatedly from the NSA to other intelligence services have been known to to be able to access everything from your emails to your bank statements to to even the te- the contents of your phone calls as they're going on to the point that they were spying on the chancellor the American secret uh, I mean not secret service excuse me the American intelligence apparatus was spying on the German chancellor <laughs> yeah, Merkel. That's right. At the exactly. UN. And, that's and right. It's just yeah. something that's also interesting to point out on that point. Not only were they spying on Merkel, but it made only the the headlines for a day or two, and there was no diplomatic blowback between the two countries. So not, not only was yeah. it forgotten by the media, but it was like, imagine your Smooth own leader. Over. You know, you're the leader of the government. You know that this country that you are subservient to in so many ways is now spying on you and you have no recourse. You have nothing to say about that. Like, absolutely insane. Because they serve the same interests. Of course. Of course. Well, but that's hegemony right there. I mean, the fact that, you know, Germany really can't see its 
foreign policy is separate from the priorities of of U.S. You know, uh, U.S. Well, look at what's look at what's happening right now. Yeah. More importantly, the the point that I'm trying to highlight is these uh, bringing all this hypocrisy into one little uh, package. If you were to mention to anybody who would, uh, who regularly on the daily overlooks these facts, uh, if you were to mention to them the Stasi in East Germany and the fairly light, uh, in comparison, uh, methods of, of uh, either censorship or, or, or um, surveillance that occurred in that particular government, the, the amount of pop culture and media presentations and books and garbage we hear ad nauseum over and over again, oh, in the Soviet system, in this system, wherever else it may be, Right, that these were horrible authoritarian systems. You couldn't live. You'd feel like you're trapped in a in a straitjacket because of all the limitations that are put on you, particularly from the surveillance apparatus. These same people live in a draconian and almost like otherworldly sort of surveillance, and they feel just fine. In fact, they don't even they they are so uh, not concerned with it that they don't even bother to read into it and realize just how much it affects their lives. It's just to kind of. Uh, build up on your guys' point of, of not only hegemony but also the, for, the the this penetration of the ideology that suits this particular system into every facet of life, be it from justifications for colonialism and imperialism, uh, be it for the dressing up of horrific crimes, basically, against particular nations, either economically or socially or militarily, in the guise of human rights and liberal democratic freedoms and other <laughs> nonsense you'd go ad nauseum. It is genuinely uh, an impressive network <laughs> that we're up against, isn't it? Uh, to, to, to put it into, I guess, a simple term. But let's, let's move on to, uh, I guess, kind of the, the, the main topic of today, as if this wasn't already uh, fairly heavy, which is um, we know what the 19th century and 20th century colonialism were like. We know what imperialism was like in the 20, 20th century and kind of what, we, what it's like in the 21st. But what about examples of almost colonial attitudes that continue to exist within the 21st century. Could you please give us, because um, you, you guys kind of went on, uh, touched onto, the, uh, onto this with the covering of the Franks still used in, in, in West Africa or Francophone Africa um, a little bit, but the 21st, quote unquote, 21st century colonialism that has managed to adapt itself to the modern political climate, uh, has managed to pass itself off through higher transparency. Could you please guide us through this? How did it do this? In what, what ways, which areas or countries or regions are currently affected in, in this? Uh, flesh, flesh this out a little bit for, for us. Yeah, there's a lot of things to say here. I'll start with um, the most obvious example of 21st century colonialism, which is Israel and Palestine. And it's actually interesting, and, it, and it, it touches with the conversation we were just having about this the sophisticated and subtle mechanisms of domination that are now in play, because I think modern Israel, with, of course, the backing of Europe and, and most notably the United States, is this sort of grotesque mixture of like 19th century brutal settler colonialism with 21st century technology. So now you have unmanned drones, you have sniper drones, you have automated border policing, right? Um, Israel sort of mobilizes the the cutting edge technology um, in order to impose itself on the Palestinian people. And you can see the ideology. What is the ideological superstructure of settler colonialism? Look in Israel. It's fascism. Look at how the people mm. that are raised in that society that are conditioned under that ideological superstructure talk about Palestinians. They're animals. They're subhuman. They're savages. We need to you know wipe them off the map. And it, it strikes the modern ear as as sort of absurd and grotesque, like, you know, at least America and these other countries are better at sort of being more subtle with the way they talk. I mean, even the war on terror in America, the U.S. got pretty damn colonial in its rhetoric about civilization, about, you know, Islam, et cetera. And we still hear that resonate uh, down today. But I think looking at Israel, the way that the people are ideologically primed to dehumanize Palestinians the way that they marry 21st te century technology with 19th century settler colonialism is an, is an interesting example of, of exactly that. And another aspect here, Israel is not the only settler colony in existence today. Of course, Australia, Canada, the United States, go down the list. But there's this, this weird sort of historical thing that happens where some people, like in, in, not in our opinion, but in the world's opinion, like some people are grandfathered into acceptability. Right. Like mm. like the what the U.S. did to the Native Americans 
is absolutely genocidal, brutal, disgusting, and it's ongoing in so many ways. Visit the reservation in the United States. See the immiseration, the poverty, the destruction of a cultural legacies, and of course, people resisting those things. You know, it's it's just it's just as real, and it's an ongoing process. There are elements of so-called Marxists, you know, patriotic socialists, etc., that want to just wrinkle past this and say, "Hey, U.S. has already uh, been um, settled, right? Um, the genocide has already happened. It's all in the past. Now we must move forward." And I think that ignores the very real, ongoing sort of settler colonial. Um, and and the oppression of, of nations within the United States' borders, of course. But but Israel makes it so explicit. Israel makes all of this stuff not academic, not going back into a book and thinking abstractly about what this means or what it's meant historically. And what could have been. Yeah, but just turn on the TV and look at how, you know, an Israeli prime minister talks about Palestinians. Look at how they actually treat those people. And it's it's the perfect example. And I think you can learn a lot just by studying, by studying that iteration. I'm going to step... Take us back for just a second. So when we're thinking about kind of new forms of uh, colonialism, neocolonialism, so it, it's worth remembering that the 21st century, as you mentioned, colonialism in the 21st century, the 21st century is often hailed as the age of globalization, progress, advancements in technology, connectivity, allowing people to come together, the development of the rules-based international order, uh, talk about the advancement of feminism across the world, all of these you know, major advancements that we talk about and the fact that we can come together as a world community against these fundamental things. But just look beneath the surface, beneath this utopian facade of what the world is developing into and what do you see? You still see that same system of exploitation that and domination that had taken place previously, but now we see it in the forms of neocolonialism, which is again an extension and a, you know constitutive of capitalism. So, what we see is that these former colonial countries have continued in many ways their the colonial practices and processes that they had previously in economic, political, and cultural realms over their formerly colonized areas, as well as, you know, we can talk about cultural hegemony and how they've uh, expanded the scope of their, their colonialism far beyond their former colonial uh, subjects. That's that that'll take us a, a long time to get to. So I'm going to step past that for a second. But what we need to know is that Neocolonialism is a manifestation of the inherent contradictions of capitalism and that we have to recognize it as such and then combat it as such. And without recognizing that modern capitalism necessitates neocolonialism and neocolonialism is a process of modern capitalism without keeping those two things linked, our analysis is going to be very, very lacking. So, you know, modern colonialism is an outgrowth in some ways, but also a, a, a further development on the colonialism of the 19th and 20th centuries, which we've been talking mm. about up to this point. So again, keeping a historical materialist analysis in mind, we have to think about how colonialism was carried out in the past in order to understand how neocolonialism has developed and is carried out today. Again, that's uh, you know something that's pretty heavy and would take us quite a bit of analysis to get through, which I think is not kind of the, the critical thing to do at this juncture in time, but perhaps... Some other time we can we can talk about those uh, those ways in which that 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 was carried out. But what we have to also an uh, analyze is that one of the ways, one of the main ways in which neocolonialism operates is through the global economic system. We've talked about this globalization uh, and how many people are hailing this as some sort of victory towards uh, you know universal human rights and and, and such. This is actually, in many cases, what allows the neocolonial system to perpetuate itself. I know that you've talked about things like the IMF and the World Bank before. These institutions which impose structural adjustment policies on developing countries, forcing them to open up their markets to foreign corporations, adhere to free market principles, etc., etc. I know that you know this is something that we've talked about on Guerrilla History. I know that this is something that you've talked about before and something that most of the listeners are going to be very intimately aware of and something that 
we probably don't need to talk about right now. I, I feel like I'm saying that a lot because this is such a huge conversation that like there's a lot of really interesting avenues and very important avenues that we could go down, but the, the scope of the conversation would become so huge that it would be impossible to actually get through anything if we did. But in addition to economic domination, neocolonialism operates through political means. And this is another very critical point that we have to understand. The installation of puppet governments, support for authoritarian regimes in post-colonial countries is a very common tactic that's used by imperial powers to maintain control of their former colonial subjects as well as other countries that they would have liked to have been their former colonial subjects and would like to exert that same sort of influence on today. These these regimes, I like using, you know, the term regime because it's been co-opted by the imperialists to describe any anti-imperialist country, essentially. But the regimes of these kind of puppet governments that are serving in the interest of the neo-colonial masters serve the interest of the foreign allies rather than the needs of their own people in these countries, leading to what we see massive uh, scale of corruption within these countries, human rights abuses to push down on any any movement that is actually yearning for true independence from their former colonial masters, uh, suppression of dissent. All we have to do is look at how fully embracing of the military dictatorship in Egypt Western colonial powers are. We, ha we can look at the support for the monarchy in Saudi Arabia. We can look at interference in domestic affairs in countries like Venezuela and Cuba, which are, of course, uh, not neo-colonial subjects, but the colonial powers would like to subject them to the same sorts of uh, structures that are in place in the other countries that we've mentioned throughout this conversation in terms of uh, modern colonialism. These are examples of neo-colonialism in action. We can also talk about the cultural sphere and how neocolonialism operates in the cultural sphere, how American culture is glorified through the media, entertainment, consumerism, homogenization of cultural um, cultural identities in various parts around the world, how local local traditions, local customs are replaced by Western ideals, consumerism. We can talk about how there's a dominance of the English language as a global language and how that's a form of modern imperialism and neocolonialism. There's a book that came out a few years ago at this point. Uh, I believe it's called Imperial Linguistics? Linguistic and Linguistic Imperialism, I think, is the title of the book. I, I'll have to look it up again. But what we have to understand is that Again, just to drive home that point that I made earlier, and I understand that this is probably a bit of a rambling answer because, again, there's so much to say. But from the perspective of any person who's coming at this from anything akin to a Marxist analysis of the world, we have to understand that neocolonialism, the colonialism of the 21st century, uh, as I think you put it uh, earlier or put it in the show notes, uh, the running order of the, of the show, this is a direct result of the capitalist system. That is the key point that we have to understand. And it perpetuates inequalities between developed and developing world because capitalism thrives on exploitation of cheap labor and resources. And it has had to evolve over time in order to do it in a way that is conducive to utilizing the, the developments in things like you know globalization uh, and, and the advancement of these so-called human, human rights that we try to push around the world. I say we as if I'm still in you know <laughs> the United States, yeah. but I, I'm not. Exactly right. And even if you were in the United States as a, uh, even if you're a member of the labor aristocracy generally, then this is only a tacit and very fragile relationship to the overarching systems of oppression across the world. Uh, and even more so for the internal peripheries within the United States and other um, quote-unquote highly economically developed areas. These people are not the ones driving this policy. These we people are very rarely even the uh, uh, people, uh, those who benefit mostly from these uh, policies. Uh, but I do understand what you mean, <laughs> definitely. But it's kind of, uh, it's the same thing as, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen this meme where it's a... Uh, like a politician statement was like, oh, I want to raise uh, taxes on the rich. And uh, it's just a picture of a guy, a, a guy who makes less than $30,000 a year yelling <laughs> at this guy. <laughs> it's like, all right, why? <laughs> Anyways, that silliness aside, this has been an incredibly, incredibly dense 
episode today. Um, we're going on in a very good way. An hour. Yeah, 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 in a fantastic way. Uh, it's going on an hour and ten minutes, uh, roughly. I had uh, three other or four other points, uh, roughly, um, but that will very easily push us into like two and a half hour territory. So I think it would be a very good idea to instead have you guys back on uh, in the future to to cover uh, everything from the you know propagandistic justifications to the way that the anti- current modern anti imperial struggle struggles form, how they grow, how they survive, uh, how they succeed, and then once they succeed, um, once uh, natural resources, for example, are collectivized, nationalized, run on some sort of socialist basis, what changes in the anti-imperial struggle what are anti-imperial struggles uh, and then we can do even more fun stuff like you know our favorite moments in history along these lines adnan has a big smile just thinking about these <laughs> i love it <laughs> i do i do it sounds yeah. so fun exactly right and we we absolutely had a, a a blast having you guys on um for our audience uh, anybody who's not well aware of their work or the work of rev left um you're really genuinely missing out not only on on incredibly entertaining content but academically presented uh very tight and and uh, densely packaged and fruitful conversations um it's generally it's an honor and a privilege to have you guys on I have to say that if you think that we're, you know, a very academic program, that's all Adnan's fault because he's the only <laughs> one of the three of us that's an actual academic. So, <laughs> hey, you know what? Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> it's honest work. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. We, we, uh, like people joke around all podcasts are each other's enemies and shit because, you know, there's a limited market, et cetera, et cetera. You know, capitalist brain talking now. But uh, we kind of cover, you know, the, the, the complete shit posters, which is what I would like to call the, the, the program. Then podcast. Podcast where you can sometimes learn something useful uh, and uh, shows where you can actually <laughs> learn something useful like yours. So we're not exactly at odds because we are not uh, fighting over the same, let's talk, uh, mood uh, that people are in during the 24-hour life cycle, but during or, which you, they would like to learn, you know? Have you seen Have you seen American commutes to work with their uh, two and a half hours of, of uh, inner city highway driving? Uh, these people have enough time to listen to two podcasts in a row. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not an issue whatsoever. Which, by the way, the vast majority of our audience isn't even American, alhamdulillah. Um, but <laughs> moving aside from this, I would like to wrap up. So, uh, can you guys please give us a, uh, a, a uh, or give the audience particularly, um, all the information, where can they see you, what are you working on, what do you have planned, um, get them excited, uh, even more so than they probably have been from just listening to today's episode. You can follow me at Twitter, um, on Twitter, X, whatever it is now, at <laughs> Adnan, A-D-N-A-N, A, Hussein, H-U-S-A-I-N, and um, especially these days with all that's happening in the world, I've kind of reactivated uh, my Twitter, uh, you know, polemical uh, juices. They've been flowing. <laughs> um, and um, I also have another small podcast that um, people might be interested in. It's called The Mudgeless, M-A-J-L-I-S. Not the one that's about Radio Central Asia and sponsored by the CIA. That's got the mm-hmm. same name. Uh, but it's about the Middle East, Islamic world, uh, diasporic Muslim culture, things like that. We have an upcoming episode on the a new book on the history of the Oud, a wonderful uh, instrument that I am now obsessed with trying to learn. So I'm only on my third lesson, but I just think it's phenomenal. It's fabulous. So check that out. And um, also I'd just say the back catalog, um, we Kate, we talked a little bit, uh, you mentioned, uh, Hakim mentioned Ibn Khaldun. We had an episode where we talked about Ibn Khaldun's social thought. Um, and, uh, you know, there might be other episodes like our Sanctions at War series. Uh, we were talking about neocolonialism. That's probably the principal way. It's been operating most recently, and we've got a series of, I don't know how many, maybe eight. Uh, more than episodes. that. It's got to be at that. least 12. Right. Yeah. So it's uh, based on this book, Sanctions at War, and we take different case studies and the whole theme of sanctions and how they've been applied. So do check out our back catalog of guerrilla history, and uh, it's great to be on. The program is a fabulous show, and uh, I think your audience might, might enjoy some of our episodes on guerrilla history. So check us out. I'm sure they will. Please, everybody, do go check out their work, check out their Patreon, check out their Twitters, and show them some love. They deserve it. Uh, absolutely brilliant work. I'll, I'll I'll tell the people how to find the Patreon and everything. Yes. So you, you can, uh, of course, you can also follow me on Twitter at Huck1995, H-U-C-K-1995. 
Um, I'm going to recommend everybody pick up Domenico Lasorto's Stalin History and Critique of a Black Legend, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, I co-translated and edited alongside my friend and collaborator Salvatore Engel de Mauro. Um, I got a copy. (laughs) You can get (laughs) the physical copy, which is very affordable and looks very awesome. Mm. Or, listeners, if you are somebody who doesn't have the financial means to do so, we intentionally... Uh, we're very excited to work with Iskra Books because they make all of their books available for free as PDF. Mm. So if you don't have the ability to pick up the print copy, and I'd love it if you did, but if you don't have the financial means to do so, it was very important to us that the PDF would be available for free uh, because this Jesus, is really what are you fucking commies? Is. Fuck me, man. <laughs> no, I know. It's like you, you often see it. this on Twitter, like, oh. You're a, you claim to be a Marxist or a communist or a socialist and you wrote a book and you're charging people money for it? Well, I can proudly say we worked for a year and a half on this project and we are giving you the PDF for free. You can get that at iskrabooks.org. Yeah. <laughs> not, 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 to men, not to quote Deng <laughs> or Dung, however you want to say his name uh, or whatever's proper, but uh, socialism is not poverty. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, of course. But, and, and also just the pitch, since I mentioned my my lovely collaborator Salvatore Engel de Mauro, uh, he and I also, and this will be one of, if not the first place that'll actually this will be announced on, we're uh, most of the way through another book translation project right now, oh. and uh, it's from a French scholar, and the tentative title for it is going to be Ecology: The Highest Stage of Communism. <laughs> I love it. Very Which, nice. of course, is playing off of both imperialism, yeah. the highest stage of capitalism, Brilliant. as well as neocolonialism, the highest stage of imperialism. But it's a history of the kind of a- the agro ecological history of the Soviet Union and Cuba. Mm. Which, I love uh, it. And that'll also be through Iskra Books, which means, again, if you don't want to pick up the print copy, and we'd love it if Mm. you did, because there's a lot of work going into it. And just seeing copies like in people's hands and places around the world is a very gratifying feeling. It's going to be available for free as a PDF anyway. So, you know, keep that keep that in mind. Uh, I'll I'll give Henry the greatest honor. Your uh, your the book that you worked on worked on uh, the Lacerda translation, which by the way I highly recommend everybody check out. It is a fantastic work, and you guys have done a great job. I read the original, I think, at the time. Um, the very first time I read it, I tasked one of my close friends to who was visiting Italy Italy to buy an Italian copy, which was professionally translated and i sat there painstakingly with a dictionary trying to go through it that's how i read it the first time and then afterwards the second time i read it i read the really bad portuguese translation to english that mm-hmm. some guy on twitter did and then finally <laughs> I, I bought the physical copy for, and i managed to read it all the way through properly but it was the book that uh, broke uh, the wood of my shelf um so thank you uh, you're welcome i'm glad to hear that uh, you know i made some lasting uh lasting impact on your dwelling whether that's you know breaking things or or whatever but I, you know also if you'd like to talk about the stalin book sometime just let me know For salvatore sure. i know is also a fan of yours so i'm sure that he would be happy to talk about it as well. As for Guerrilla History, you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Guerrilla History with Guerrilla being spelled G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L-A History. We're 100% listener funded and it's a political project. So like the we, we don't really make much money on it, but it's nice to pay for the platform fees and stuff like that. So, you know, pitch in a if you're uh, if you're a listener, we've got some bonus content on on there, and you can follow the show on Twitter at gorilla underscore pod. With again, gorilla being spelled G U E R R I L L A underscore pod. Uh, these uh, guys make absolutely fantastic work. Likewise with Rev Left, um, so check out all their work. Uh, all the links will be in the description as mentioned. <laughs> and that is it for today. Um, this has been the program. I'm Hakim. I'm Yugopnik. I'm Adnan. <laughs> Lovely. And I'm Henry. <laughs> uh, Let's hope your nose doesn't peel off. I don't break that nose, baby. Yeah. <laughs>